Hi, everyone. Welcome. You should be able to see me and hear me. Uh, my name is Daryl Hornick Becker, and I am a policy and advocacy associate at the Citizens Committee for Children of New York. Thank you so much for joining our webinar today on youth services in New York City. Uh, a little bit of housekeeping before we get started. Um, everyone should be on mute right now, um, but you should be able to see me and hear me. If there's any technology issues, if I cut out at any point, please let us know in the chat. We can get that resolved right away so I'm not talking into the void. Um, my colleague Carlos Rosales from CCC is also here. He'll be managing the chat and the Q&A. Uh, and I think our plan is to get through the content here and then we'll have a Q&A session at the end. So please make sure to um, keep your questions, uh, write them down, memorize them, and then we'll get to them at the end and uh, pop them in the chat or Q&A and we'll, we'll make sure if there's anything that needs to be addressed immediately, Carlos will also let me know about that. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today. We're going to talk about youth services in NYC and why they are necessary to a COVID recovery. Uh, just a little breakdown of what we're going to do today. We're going to first talk about the programs that make up the youth services sector in NYC. Uh, and we'll then move on to how those programs were affected by the budget and how children and people and communities are going to be impacted by those budget cuts. We'll then get to how those programs have adapted since the pandemic really started and why those programs are important to us recovering from the pandemic. Um, and then lastly, we'll get to what CCC and its partners have been doing in the process. Um, and then again, we'll get to the Q&A. So let's start looking at the system as a whole. Uh, so New York City's after school system is made up of a network of programs run by the Department of Youth and Community Development. These programs offer a lot of education focused programming as well as sports, uh, any kind of recreation. They do a lot of art, they do games, um, and they do uh, any kind of skill building activities. What, what's important to remember is that there's a lot of after school options that we're not going to talk about here today. Uh, Department of Education schools have their own funded programs many times. DOE community schools often have programs run through their community school partner. Uh, there are programs that are funded by state grants, by federal grants. Um, those probably we're not going to focus on today. And then, of course, there's the vast array of privately offered programs after school, karate classes, music classes, all the different private paid for programs that, that we know of. What we're going to talk about today is those publicly funded programs specifically run through the city, through the Department of Youth and Community Development. And you'll see why we focus on these programs in particular a little later, because these are the ones that are affected most by the budget this year. So we'll start with COMPASS. COMPASS is the comprehensive after school system of NYC. Uh, this serves all grades, grades K through 12 during non-school hours, usually three hours a day, five days a week. Um, and we know why those hours are important because those are prime childcare hours for working parents and working families. So that's why after school in general is such an important facet of all parts of our economy and our city. Compass has multiple programs within it. Uh, there's Compass Elementary, which is very large. Uh, and as its name suggests, it's after school programming specifically for grades K through five elementary school students. Compass is, by the way, based in, in schools as well. And so Compass Elementary does a lot of focus on literacy and literacy instruction, homework help, basic arts instruction, as well as physical activity, get little kids moving, and they do nutritional programming as well. Compass also has another program called Compass Explore, which is open to all ages, um, which is more focused on project-based learning, as in students get to kind of focus on one thing for the, the duration of the program. Compass also offers after-school high school programs just for ninth and 10th graders. Um, it's also project-based learning, again, giving older students, more autonomy with what they get to do after school. They also have a, a big focus on mental health, counseling, and case management. And as we'll see later, Compass High and Compass Explorer are pretty small programs in terms of enrollment compared to Compass Elementary. And compared to our last Compass program, we'll touch on Compass for middle schoolers, grades six through eight. Now, the reason that came last is because we actually have a separate name for it. Uh, it's a very large program in terms of enrollment and participation. And so there's a separate name for Compass Middle 6 through 8, and that is called SIG. And that stands for Schools Out NYC. So again, this is also like the other parts of Compass. It's three hours a day, usually five days a week. 
because it's slightly older students, they just give them a little more autonomy and choice in what they get to do. And they offer a lot of similar programs in terms of education, sports, arts, and youth leadership, a lot more leadership opportunities for the older students, uh, but they structure it more like clubs. So it's a little more fun for, for these uh, middle schoolers. So in terms of how enrollment breaks down amongst these programs, this breakdown is as of 2018. That was the last time we had numbers for the different age groups. But as you'll see, Compass Middle or Sonic, as we call it, uh, takes up a large portion of all these students. There are about 70,000 students who are enrolled school year, year round, 70,000 Compass Middle School students. Another significant portion are Compass Elementary students, a little over 50,000. And you'll see a small part of that pie are the Compass High and Compass Explore students. Uh, and this kind of makes sense. Compass High, the older students, they have more choice, they have more, uh, more options in terms of what to do after school beyond just public programs within their schools. So there's a little less participation at the older levels, um, but there's also other programs for them too, which we'll talk about a little later. But Compass Middle and Compass Elementary grades K through eight, that's really the heart of the after school program system. So in total, between all of Compass and Sonic, you have in 2018, 100, over 126,000 students were enrolled just in Compass and Sonic. In 2019, that enrollment went down slightly, but still over 122,000 students were enrolled. So that is a significant. Um, and between all these programs, Sonic, Compass Elementary, Compass High, and Compass Explorer, there's about a thousand sites across the five boroughs of New York City, all at schools. So that's the Compass enrollment breakdown. But in addition to Compass and Sonic, there are other after school programs that are publicly funded and that offer similar programming. So one of these is called Beacons. The reason these are separate is because they have a separate program and funding stream from DYCD. So these are also, Beacons are also operating out of schools during non-school hours, usually three hours a day, usually five days a week, that same vital time that, that adults need childcare. Beacons, one slight difference between Beacons and Compass programming is that Beacons is really supposed to be more community focused in terms of helping the community and not necessarily attached to that one school. And so they offer it for all age youth, K through 12. They also do have programming for adults and for seniors, things like GED classes, things like job training. Um, so Beacons have that difference from Compass. Uh, again, a lot of the programming is academically focused. They offer homework tutoring, there's life skills, civic engagement and community building are big parts of, of Beacon programming. The recreation and health opportunities. Uh, and they also offer culture and art trips, movie trips, museum trips. Uh, beacons offer that as well. Uh, one of the things we always hear about beacons is their youth councils, which are like student government opportunities that, that students have the opportunity to participate in. In terms of the size of beacons, 2019, there were 93 beacon sites across the city serving over 74,000 youth, which is really significant. Uh, and in terms of the adult programming they offer for adults and seniors, about half as many, 46,000, um, a little over half adults are served by beacon programs. In addition to beacons outside of Compass and Sonic, you have after school programs called Cornerstones. Again, slightly separate funding stream through the city, so a different program. And the main difference with Cornerstones is that they're similar to beacons, except they are not school based. They operate out of NYCHA community centers. But similar to beacons, they're really supposed to be community focused in terms of their programming. So, like beacons, they offer programming to all age youth, K through 12, but they also offer programs to adults and seniors. Again, a lot of academic focus, a lot of, of homework help, after school tutoring, life skills. They do high school and college prep, a lot of project-based activities, STEM, creative and performing arts. Again, entrepreneurship and youth councils, the kind of activities that really help young children build skills and build leadership skills, which is why these programs are so valuable. And in terms of the scope and size of Cornerstones in 2019, about 101 sites, so a couple more than Beacon, but a similar number. And they served a smaller group. They served about 25,000 youth and they served for about a little over 4,000 adults through their adult programming. So if we combine this all, you'll see that this gives us a sense of what enrollment is like in after school programs during the school year. Emphasis on during the school year because we're gonna really pivot to summer shortly because um, that's where budget cuts are. But do you wanna get a sense of the scope of youth services during the school year in New York City? What you have here is you Combine those Compass and Sonic enrollments and you have 120, over 122,000 students served during the school year. Beacons serve over 74,000, Compass is over 25,000. And in total, in 2019, you have over 222,000 children and youth served in school year programs. That is significant, right? That is a lot of students. If that was its own school district, it would be a very large school district. In terms of New York, 
it's less so, but it's still very significant. So if we put these numbers next to all the students in the Dewey public school system, 1.1 million students, you'll see that nearly 20% of all public school students are receiving after school programming. And again, it's nearly 20% are receiving after school programming just in those programs we're talking about. That represents the majority of the system, but far from the whole system. So those are the, those are the programs we're talking about and they represent 20% of all public school students. We also have this indicator here just showing maybe the need for after school programs, how the DOE defines students in poverty, students who qualify for free or reduced price lunch, um, or students who qualify for HRA benefits. That's a significant portion of the students in the DOE and just from those students giving them free, affordable, high quality after school programming is really significant. So these are big numbers we're talking about in terms of the scope of the youth services system operated through DYCD. Now, all those things I mentioned for these school year programs continue over the summer, right? Compass, Sonic, Beacon, and Cornerstones all have summer programming uh, that they offer their students and families. Uh, and enrollment is pretty high. It's less so compared to the school year, as you see here, but enrollment's still pretty high. So in terms of middle schoolers, while they make up the majority of school year enrollment, they dip a little bit in terms of summer enrollment. And a lot of that is for budgetary reasons we'll discuss later. Um, Compass Elementary, there's a slight dip in terms of enrollment if for elementary school students who are taking things during the summer. And in Compass I and Compass Explorer, those are small programs to start and then they have a, a smaller enrollment during the summer. But you'll see these numbers are still, are still fairly significant. The other summer program we'll talk about today, and it's significant because it was affected by budget cuts, is the Summer Youth Employment Program. So this is not an after school program, it's obviously an employment program. You guys are probably already familiar with this, but it serves ages 14 to 24, so almost all teens and slightly older than teens in New York City. Uh, Community-based organizations that contract with DYCD to match their participants, their youth teen participants, with employers and job sites through both the public sector and the private sector. A lot of CBO, a lot of CBOs match youth with day camps and summer camps that we just mentioned, right? They work at these exact same camps, a lot of them work in entrepreneurship positions, a lot of them work in offices. There's a lot of different SYP placements. And most importantly, it provides valuable income to teens over the summer. Uh, income that is sometimes supplemental, but can also be vital, right? To not just that, that team, but to that family. And this is a large program. A lot of different cities have SYP programs for teens, but New York City's is by far the largest with last year's work participation in 2019 being over 74,000 students. To get a sense of kind of the impact that that can have on our economy as a city, uh, we have this helpful chart that our, my colleague Maria put together, which shows SYP enrollment over the years from 2007 to 2019, combined with how it affected teen unemployment. And teen unemployment refers specifically to teens 16 to 19, actively seeking employment seasonal or full-time who are unemployed. And as you can see, as SYP enrollment has increased, it has a dramatic impact on teen unemployment decreasing. You can also see this dip in the middle was in regards to the last time we had a big economic downturn like the one we're experiencing now in terms of the recession and by investing and growing our SYP enrollment and our SYP program, we saw a dramatic decline in teen unemployment coming out of the recession. So that is a sense of the after school programs and the summer programs that continue from the school year. And now one first we have to talk about why we're here today, which is the survival of those programs. So on April 16th, 2020, the mayor released his executive budget for the city fiscal year 21. Now the mayor's executive budget is not the budget for the city. It still needs to be negotiated with the city council and then agreed upon uh, by June 30th, but it does give a sense of his priorities. And this year it was even more important because we were staring down a pretty bad budgets uh, situation as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. For an idea of what that budget situation was, the before the executive budget in January, the mayor releases a preliminary budget, a kind of first crack at the budget to give a sense of what he's looking at and what they're assuming they can provide and what they're assuming are coming in in terms of tax revenue. And that budget was around $95.3 billion, which is around New York City's budget, a little over $90 billion. That 95.3 went all the way down to 89.3 because of COVID. So what COVID did was it created a budget deficit in fiscal year 21, our next fiscal year of $6 billion and a projected loss of tax revenue of tax collection of $7.4 billion. We're hearing now that that loss of tax revenue could even be as high as $10 billion. 
So this is a very bad budget situation. Now, what the mayor did was he tried to close this gap he was seeing in the budget through a combination of things. They used a lot of city reserves, so like rainy day funds the city had saved. But unfortunately, you also have to have cuts. You have to have cuts and reductions. But those cuts and reductions were not equal across the city. They were really largely out of certain areas. Um, one of those biggest areas was education. We'll, do, we'll be doing at CCC another webinar on some of the cuts to education and the remote learning that's happening there. But unfortunately, the other area that was really cut was youth services. So what the mayor proposed in his FY21 executive budget was the total elimination of summer youth programs, of those summer programs that we just talked about. Um, the mayor did this with the message that they couldn't safely operate in the summer. We can't have camps with kids running around because they can't safely socially distance. We can't have SYP because we don't know what jobs are going to be like. We can't have people in offices. Um, and so that was a lot of the reasoning, but we can talk later why that reasoning is flawed. And I think a lot of you out there probably know why that reasoning is flawed because look at us here working, right? So in terms of the total elimination of summer youth programs, what that amounts to is an FY21, a total of $175 million cut from these programs. The biggest chunk of that is SYEP because SYEP is the most expensive. Why? Because they're not just paying providers to operate the programs, but they're paying the teams to participate in them. And so a big chunk of that 175 million was 116 million from SYEP. About 36.5 million was from the Compass Summer Programs. 5.7 million was from Sonic. Quick note here, if, if this might be confusing to some people who are, are new to this, when we talked about Compass at the beginning, I talked about how Compass includes these several programs, Compass Elementary, Compass High, Compass Explorer, and Compass Middle, which is called Sonic. So often, well, although, although Sonic is part of Compass, something we say a lot is Compass and Sonic. Compass referring to everything but middle, majority elementary school programming, and then Sonic referring to middle school programming. So that's that why we differentiate those things. Um, so again, a, a big chunk of money coming out of Compass Summer, because again, that's the majority of the programs for the summer is in elementary school. 5.7 million coming from Sonic, which doesn't seem so bad, but the thing with Sonic, and if anyone here is familiar with Sonic or familiar with middle school summer programming, it's actually not in the budget. It hasn't been in the budget for, I think, about five years now. What happens is it's not included in the budget, and advocates like CCC, in conjunction with our partners in the Campaign for Children, which is a, a coalition that fights for after school and youth services programs, have to get it put back in the budget for one year only. That's what we've had to do the past five years. So that's where the majority of middle school spots come from. Um, and that's actually why a lot of the middle school enrollment is lower during the summer than the elementary school enrollment because the spots come last minute, they're not fully funded, and then programs have a hard time developing those programs and then filling those spots. So we're always arguing for 34,000 spots for $20 million. Being that the mayor is proposing eliminating even the small portion that he already pays for, right? We're, in, we're saying that that's also means that he's planning on excluding that one-time funding we always fight for. So that's 5.7 million from Sonic on top of the exclusion of this $20 million with the majority of spots. And lastly, they eliminated the Cornerstone and Beacon Summer programs, which was, was around $8.5 million each. And so all told, as $175 million, and it's the total elimination of summer youth employment of Compass and Sonic Summer and of Cornerstone and Beacon Summer. So what does this mean? Who gets impacted here? So if we crunch the numbers, if we look at Compass and Sonic enrollment, and you can see here, I won't go back, we can, we can visit it later, but you can see here Compass and Sonic Summer enrollment combined last year around 70,000. Uh, as we saw in that bar chart, Summer Youth Employment Program combined around Summer Youth Employment is about 74,000 participation. And then, um, Beacons and Cornerstones, we don't have an exact number of the students just enrolled in summer. We know it's obviously less than the amount enrolled during the school year. But our, working with our colleagues at United Neighborhood Houses, they looked at the contracts that these programs had over the summer and in terms of how many students are supposed to be in those programs. And if they calculated just a, uh, a conservative estimate of how many were enrolled, they, we estimate that there's probably around 30,000 people conservatively enrolled in Cornerstone and Beacon programs over the summer. And so approximately what we're looking at is the amount of children who are losing summer camps, who are losing any kind of summer academic help, all of those summer programs offerings that they, that they offer. In addition to summer youth employment, we're looking at 175,000 students easily, right? It could be a lot more than that, but we, we're comfortable saying 175,000 students are gonna, are gonna lose their programs this summer as a result of these budget cuts. Now, while that's a citywide issue, Right. Well, 175,000 is a significant number of students, and they are all across the city. 
The truth is that these cuts have a disproportionate impact on certain areas of the city, right? Specifically on communities that heavily rely on after school sites. So we, we did an analysis looking at Compass, Sonic, Beacon, and Cornerstone sites. And what we found is that well, some sites have maybe 10 to some uh, community districts and neighborhoods in the city have around 10 to 20 after school sites. Some have significantly more, 30 to 40, almost 50. And so these are the top 10 community districts with after school sites in the city. East Harlem, you'll see, has a lot. The Lower East Side has a lot, has a lot of big providers in the Lower East Side. Uh, Washington Heights, East New York, and Brownsville, Bed-Stuy, all Central Brooklyn, all in a similar area. That's significant, right? Because while these are the sites in the area, they can serve children from anywhere. But if those three the communities are all losing summer programmings, right, where are those kids going to go? Um, Jamaica as well, parts of the Bronx and Concourse, Highbridge, and Morrisania. So all of these places have a lot of after-school sites that are likely going to lose their summer programming. I say likely because we can't say for certain that these all have summer programs, but it's safe to assume that Compass programs have summer portions, that, that their Sonic programs have a lot of summer portions. And if that, if one community has 50 sites, close to 50 sites, that's a lot of kids in summer camp who aren't going to have the option in that community. If you want to get a sense geographically of what I'm talking about, you can look at this map we put together. And so this is Compass, Sonic, Cornerstone, and Beacon locations by zip code. And you'll see the darker areas of this map here represent where there's more. And so those are those areas I mentioned, right? You'll see Central Brooklyn, East New York, Bed-Stuy, Brownsville. You see the dark blue and the purple. You also see it in parts of the Bronx and parts of Harlem and in Jamaica, Queens over there. And so that gives you a sense of where in the city are kids who rely the most on free summer camp with free summer programming options and SYP. Um, though this doesn't, this map doesn't include SYP, sorry. Uh, and then where in the city they're gonna lose those programs. Now, the other side of this is that those, those areas would be hit hard if we were in normal times, right? Those areas would be hit hard if this was just a difficult budget year and we were facing budget cuts, but we're not just facing budget cuts, we're facing a pandemic. And the real unfortunate side of this is that a lot of those same communities that were hit, that are gonna be hit hardest by these budget cuts that are gonna lose the most programming for the most kids are also areas of the city that were hit hardest by this pandemic, that were hit hardest by COVID-19. So this is a map showing data we've collected uh, from Department of Health that shows COVID cases per 100,000 people by zip code. You can see a lot of the same areas. And again, this probably isn't news to anyone. This isn't a surprise. We know that COVID's had a disparate impact on low-income communities, on communities of color, but we need to really belly the point that the same areas that have suffered loss, that are have uh, already had struggles with poverty, struggles with housing, struggles with healthcare, that relied on these programs, are the same areas that also are getting the sickest, that are seeing the most death, unfortunately. And those are the areas that we're losing vital programs and vital supports in. Uh, and lastly, these, these two maps I showed you uh, showing Compass, Sonic, Beacon, and Cornerstone sites, COVID-19 data. COVID-19 data you can see is available. It's updated weekly. Um, it's a new indicator we put on our website. And it's available on our database, data.cccnewyork.org. And in addition to our database, we also have an asset mapper where we map all of the after-school programs I've mentioned. You can see on the side here, Compass Elementary, Middle School, High School Explorer, Beacon Cornerstone and any other DYCD programs. And you can see for yourself where these are around the city. You can see where they are in your neighborhood. You can see who the provider is providing it. Um, and it can give you a sense of mapping community resources. That's also on our database data at CCC New York slash asset mapping. So that's a sense of how these cuts are gonna impact us. But what's important in, in terms of how we're preparing and already are pushing back against these cuts is that there's after school programs operating right now. There's youth services happening right now. And those programs have already adapted, right? And so the reasoning that these cuts can occur because there's no way for summer camps for after school programs to operate this summer safely is not true. And we know that because of what's happening right now. So ways in which programs have adapted, right? Just like we took 1.1 million children and in a week we put them all in remote learning, obviously with some challenges, Right after school programs had to do the exact same things and they adapted and they adapted quickly. So the, one of the biggest things after school programs have been doing since the transition to remote learning was they've been doing remote homework help and remote tutoring, right? All those, when I was describing those programs, so much of it was academically focused, so much of it was for, the, for little kids was literacy instruction, for 
for older students, was, was engaging them in projects. And they've been continuing to do that. They've been continuing to do remote homework, help and tutoring, literacy instruction for the younger children. But importantly, they're also dealing with a lot of the challenges of remote, right? So one of those is technology issues. The DOE is working hard on distributing devices, but getting an iPad in the hands of a third grader doesn't necessarily mean they're gonna know how to get into Google Suite and on their classroom and edit a Google Doc and do these remote things that they're now being tasked with doing. And so we've heard from programs that are really working closely with not just the kids, but with the parents, right? To understand the new technology that's in their hands and to help them engage in in the classroom, the remote classroom they have to engage in now. They're also doing what they always do, right, which is arts, games, and music, but they're doing it remotely um, because those things you can do remotely. And those things are so important right now, right? Kids are home all day. They're not going to school. They're not seeing their friends. These after-school programs which engage them in arts and games and music are some of their most important social interactions of the day and some of the only times maybe they get to feel like they're having fun again. We saw recently, we had a meeting with providers where a, a beacon provider at the um, Coalition for Hispanic Family Services showed us a music video that they had made with their kids. And it was a fun music video and it was, it was fun to see them air play guitars and sing and, and, and rap about being stuck inside. But what I thought was, man, for two or three hours, however long that they made this video, those kids were having fun and engaged and those parents didn't have to worry about them. And that kind of programming and engagement is so important right now, right? And that's where at the risk of losing for the entire summer. They've also been doing, a, they're continuing to try to do a lot of physical fitness and karate, just like a lot of us are now home trying to stay active, but somehow also stay indoors and safe. They've been doing that with kids and engaging them in what previously they would have gym time and run around, but trying to give them those outlets, we give it to them remotely and safely. The other super important thing that, that after school programs and youth services, CBOs, providers are doing right now is that they're serving the communities that they've always served, right? These CBOs have connections with communities that DOE, that DYCD, that the city, that feeding efforts, that all these things can't necessarily connect with the way that CBOs who have been serving the community forever can connect with. They've been delivering meals to families they're suddenly food insecure because sometimes they're the first ones to know, right? They're the first ones to hear from a family. It's harder to get food these days. How, where can I get food? They're connecting them. So they're connecting them to those kind of supports. We've also heard so much about CBOs being the intermediaries between people at the DOE who are trying to facilitate getting kids devices, engaging with kids who haven't been attending remote class, and CBOs facilitating that connection with, okay, you haven't heard from the DOE, let's connect you to the DOE. You haven't filled out a survey to request a device, let's do that. Um, they're also the ones who are aware of the families and the students who aren't being engaged. Well, the DOE is, can be very unaware of those students, right? If they're not engaging, if they're reaching out to the family and the family is not getting that communication, if the family is largely uh, um, language and proficient, they're not gonna be able to engage with the DOE the way that they're comfortable with engaging with the CBO. Not to mention CBOs aren't the government. And so for families that are worried about any kind of status issues, they're much more comfortable talking with CBOs than they are necessarily with the DOE. And one really important thing that, that CBOs have been doing is they've been the ones who have been staffing DOE's regional enrichment centers. So these regional enrichment centers are these pop-up learning centers that the DOE has opened really just for the children of essential workers so that they have a place to go while people are still working. Um, but they turn to the CBOs themselves to staff them. So every time we talk to providers, their staff right now, they have ones who are still doing virtual programming. And then if they were able to, they have ones who are working at these regional enrichment centers. And that's important because if we continue to have regional enrichment centers over the summer, which it sounds like we will, but at the same time, we decimate the summer funding for these CBOs, which that's what they're proposing, right? How are we supposed to actually combine these two? So these are all the ways that programs are engaging students right now, remotely and safely and serving their communities, right? These are all the ways that we're trying to call attention to the fact that there are ways to operate safely this summer. We're already doing it and we need to continue doing it. But there's also, because of all those things, we wanna make sure that we understand that these are more than just after school services. This is more than just a summer camp for kids. This is more than just homework help, right? These things are really vital to the recovery that we're gonna to try to make as a city coming out of this pandemic. In terms of education, right? These after school programs have, these summer programs specifically have always been vital in combating learning loss, right? Summer melts and learning loss is a real thing. We have all had it, we've all experienced it. But these programs which provide fun academic ways to engage students have always been an important way to keep students academically engaged over the summer before they go back to school in the fall. 
they're going to be way more important now, A, because we don't know what school in the fall is going to look like, and B, because so many students aren't just going to have learning loss over the summer, but they're going to have a learning loss from this period of remote, right? We know that students aren't necessarily catching up um, before this period of remote, and these, these after-school programs are combating learning loss right now, and we need them to continue. And if we cut off the homework help and tutoring that these kids are getting right now, what are they supposed to do over the summer? On top of this, the mayor recently announced that there's going to be significant portion of students in summer school. 178,000 students will be taking summer school this year. A lot of those students are the same students who are receiving supports after school now. And so we're talking about they're going to continue in school, they're going to continue doing remote learning during the day, but their usual 3 p.m. homework help, their usual 3 p.m. fun art class, there's something they can look forward to, is going to be cut. Uh, and that's just not tenable for these students. Second, the recovery is going to be, has to be part of, vital to the recovery is going to be the social emotional health of our children, right? Think of what we're all dealing with in terms of our social emotional health, and then put that on a child, right? So they're dealing with social isolation, not seeing their friends and not going to school. You have families now that are dealing with hunger and food insecurity like they never have before. You have families dealing with housing instability that they never have before. You have tons of loss of income with job loss. And then on top of all that, you have what is probably the worst of all, which is the potential loss of a loved one, of a parent, of a, of a grandparent, of a caregiver. And again, like we saw that map earlier, what's really important is that the children dealing with these issues the most, right, are the, the children in areas where COVID-19 has hit the city the hardest, are the same children who are losing the most programming, right, when we saw on that map. And that's why it's, we're really trying to call attention to the fact that where COVID-19 hits, these cuts hit, right? And we're asking those with the least to give up the most. In terms of social emotional health, that couldn't be more important. Physical health, right, for obvious reasons. Kids just need to be active over the summer. And if we expect them to have no form of engagement, no jobs, no summer camp, no after school programming, if they're in summer school, what do we expect them to do, right? They're either going to stay inside and they, they can't get any physical health opportunities, or they're not going to socially distance on their own, and they're going to try to be physically healthy in very unsafe ways. So that's another big part of the wise recovery. And then lastly, it's about supporting families, right? If we do start reopening soon as a city, if parents are starting to try to get back to work, right, not, not non, right, these non-essential workers who are starting to go back to the office, or parents who lost a job and need to start looking for work, they're going to need to have care options for their kids, right? And summer school, summer camps and summer programs have always been a form of childcare, somewhere you can take your kid for the day while you're working, right? If they don't have those options, parents aren't going to be able to get back to work. Parents aren't going to be able to get back to the office. Second, like we said, the recovery effort is going to be all about supporting people, right? It's about supporting people in terms of hunger, in terms of housing, in terms of education, and these CBOs are the ones doing it. They're the ones who are engaging parents on the front lines and connecting them with those supports. If you cut their funding, uh, if you cut their staffs, if you've cut their programs, they're not gonna connect with those parents and you're leaving those, those, those children and families on their own right when they need it this summer when we're trying to get back up to a functioning city and economy. And it goes without saying, the income, I think I mentioned this, that SYP provides to teens is really important income over the summer. And it's not just supplemental to what families get, but if you had a, a, a loss of a love of a parent or a caregiver, or if you had loss of a job, the, a, a teen, especially an older one, could be the sole provider and breadwinner for that family now. And so SYP is vital to providing that income. And the last thing we really want to touch on in terms of why these budget cuts are so harmful. Yes, it's for all these reasons. And yes, it's because of everything they do over the summer. But we also want to call attention to this matters for the long-term stability and survival of these CBOs, of these programs that are doing the frontline most important work serving the community. If you cut summer funding, they are going to cut their summer staffs. They also have staffs that are not summer staffs that are full-time, but, but they can't support 12 months of full-time staff on a 10-month budget, right? And so we've already heard from, heard from uh, many providers, university settlement, the huge after school and youth services provider sent a letter yesterday. Providers are laying off hundreds of seasonal staff, right? A lot of these seasonal staff, by the way, are from the communities they're serving, right? So again, it's, that, it's a, just a, a second way that they provide supports and provide income. They're laying off hundreds of seasonal staff and they're furloughing full-time workers, right? So it's a huge loss of income. And to expect that they're going to be able to pop those staff back in the after school come the fall, or get those full-time workers back on board in terms of fall, 
and be able to scale up and develop through the school year when we don't even know what the school year looks like is not realistic. And so we're talking about CBOs may not be able to survive these cuts. They can't operate year round on a 10 month budget. They can't continue operating over the summer and they're not gonna be ready for the fall. And so this is really about the long term stability and survival of the sector. And that's what we're really also trying to focus on in addition to all of these other things. So I probably have everyone worried. That's fair. Um, and I'm sorry to be the bearer of bad news. That is the nature of the budget this year. And I think we're all getting used to things like bad news. But CCC and its partners have been engaging in a lot of the advocacy efforts to what we're going to call save the summer, right? And so most of our advocacy is done in coalition because we are stronger together, right? In CCC, we pride ourselves in our research and our data and our policy and analysis, but we're not providers ourselves. So we partner with the YMCA, we partner with the Children's Aid, we partner with Good Shepherd Services, with United Neighborhood Houses, with UJA. We all form the Campaign for Children. Um, and we've been together for, I believe 12 years, the Campaign for Children has been formed. Uh, they do a lot of early childhood advocacy, C4C as we call it, has also instrumental in getting pay parity for early childhood educators. But we also are always the people fighting for, like I said, those middle school summer slots that we have to fight to get back into the budget every year. Well, now we're fighting for that and a whole lot more, right? So all everything we've been doing, we've been doing it in conjunction with the Campaign for Children. So what the campaign has been doing, first, we came up with a statement on the budget did that these cuts were terrible. We also sent a letter to the mayor and the speaker, had over 150 orgs sign on, that eliminating these summer camps without any kind of alternative is to abandon the children and young people in the communities who rely on them when they need them the most, right? And that's kind of the message we're trying to hammer home. Uh, we sent that letter to the mayor and to the speaker. We've also been engaging a lot of social media advocacy, you know, just like everyone else, this is a different time for us and we're trying to figure out the best way to do things. So our advocacy, which is meeting with city council members, which is going to the steps of city hall, um, which is, making public press appearances, all of that, right, can't necessarily happen now. And so we're really trying to make constructive efforts in the ways we can. And one of those is through social media. So we have a hashtag, please feel free to use it. It's hashtag fund youth NYC. We've been conducting a lot of Twitter storms, which have been much more active than I thought and, and productive than I thought they would be. And they've engaged um, city council members themselves on Twitter to inter interact with us and to call attention to our issues and to support us. We've also had Q&As on Twitter where we have questions for providers on Twitter who are explaining to people in social media how they're operating programs safely now, how they're engaging children now, and how they can continue those, those opportunities over the summer. We've also done what we're calling virtual rallies. Um, that is where we are all in our Zoom, on our gallery view, we have a fun background and we have speakers. Um, we had a very large one before the youth services here in the meeting that many council members attended. Um, and these would be the equivalent of a city hall rally on the steps of city hall that we've done in the past, call attention to our issues to get council members on our side. Um, what's convenient is that we can hold these a lot faster and we can hold many more of them. So I think we have three coming up this week. Um, we have more next week. We've had several already and we have a big one before the youth services hearing, as I mentioned. The other thing we've done is we're not just advocating, but we're trying to also be realistic and help our leaders understand what we're talking about. So we've developed mostly with the with providers developed and, and we just kind of marketed out there was a summer program work plan, as in what do these programs do now for students remotely in terms of engagement and then what can they look like over the summer, whether we're trying to socially distance, whether we're trying to do it remotely. And while we proposed a work plan for kind of both scenarios, I think it's clear now that they were going to really be trying to do remote programming, which is fine, which is something that they can, they have been doing and can continue to do. Um, one thing we make clear in these advocacy materials is that we want to work with the mayor, with the city council, with DYCD, that these programs can't look like they have in the past, right? We're not saying give us all the same funding, give us all the same structure and scope of what programs have looked like in the past, because we know that if that's not realistic. Right? We're asking not for full restoration, but we're asking for some funding so that we can get alternatives in place. So we're not leaving 175,000 kids with nothing. Right? Those kids are getting services now. Help us continue to give them services in remote and constructive and safe ways so that they have some options this summer. Uh, and yet, lastly, we've tried to really focus on getting press and youth involved. We've had a, a, some good amount of press hits, but we're hoping to get more. Um, and we've started a separate youth committee just for having young people who are affected by these cuts, teens and SYP, people who have been in beacons and cornerstones and poppets programming and providers of those youth programs themselves 
involved in their own youth committee that was able to produce a testimony uh, that they submitted to council, they've produced images, they've attended the virtual rallies. So we're making sure that hopefully that, that youth voices are also at the front of this movement. So some updates on the advocacy front, and I'll wrap up soon so we can get time for questions, um, is that the Youth Services Hearing, the Department of Youth and Community Development Commissioner, Bill Chong, he mentioned that SYP might have some movement. So they indicated that there's gonna be some work towards an SYP alternative, possibly for around 15,000 teens, possibly involving some combination of restored public funds and private funds. That's really good. We think that is a huge momentum coming from the fact that they cut everything and they said it can't happen. Now too, they're developing an alternative to at least one of these programs, SYP. But unfortunately, we haven't heard of any kind of program in place for the alternatives for all those other programs we talk about, right? Compass, Sonic, Beacon, and Cornerstone. And those of all the kids impacted serve the most. They serve those 100,000 kids in those programs who are going to lose summer programming. And they, we haven't noticed really any movement in terms of what an alternative for those can look like. We've gotten a lot of council members to echo our call, to use our hashtag on Twitter, to attend our rallies, to question the, the commissioner doing youth services and to make clear that they support funding youth programs. But this is a really tough budget year. This is a very unique situation. The council usually has a good amount of leverage in terms of their budget negotiating with the mayor. They also have a list of council initiatives that they usually like to fund, right? These are one-year initiatives, but they're continually funded by their own dollars that the council has to spend. It's unclear if they even have that money this year um, or if any of those council funded initiatives can be realistic. So while it's been great to have council members vocally support us, it's hard to know how much leverage they actually have in the current budget year. Uh, and lastly, some ways that you guys can take action immediately. I mentioned with the Campaign for Children, use the hashtag on Twitter if you're socially active on social media. Use the hashtag FundYouthNYC or search it and follow the people who use it. You'll see the different opportunities to get involved. You can tweet at your own council member. They are, they are following, they are, I promise you council members are very active on Twitter, especially these days. You can follow them and you can tweet at them about the importance of summer programs. And on CCC's website, we have a Campaign for Children Action Alert set up so that you can send an email to your council member, as well as the mayor speaker and DYCD commissioner all about funding summer youth programs. In addition to that, I would just say, stay on touch of CCC emails in terms of how other ways to get involved in these advocacy efforts. And so with that, I think we have pretty good, a little less than 15 minutes. Let's open it up to questions. I'm gonna hand it off to Carlos to go through the Q&A, which I'm sure is full of questions and just pitch them to me, if that works for you, Carlos. Great, um, thank you, Daryl, um, for a really great and comprehensive um, presentation. Just for everyone who's um, either listening by phone or on their computers, you're still muted. So if you'd like to speak on your Zoom menu, you should see a little button that says raised hand or it looks like a hand symbol. That way I can know who to unmute and I'll call on your name. Um, for anyone who's joining uh, via telephone, um, I'm unmuting uh, all of you automatically uh, since you won't be able to access that function. Um, so just feel free to chime in or speak up whenever there's a pause in between questions. Um, and then lastly, you can also just tap in the chat box or the Q&A box. Um, so Daryl, the first question we have is from Sandra. Uh, she wanted to, she, her question was, um, if there is a deadline for the alternative plan to summer youth programs, and has the council already voted on the mayor's proposed budget, or is this happening soon? So if I forget the questions, remind me. I think the first one was, is the, uh, is there a deadline for the, for the alternative plan? There isn't a clear deadline. Um, we've already given it to them because they said that they want us to see plans. And so they do have the plan that they're reviewing. Um, the overall, the deadline is the same as I think what the second question gets at, which is the overall budget timeline. So the budget has to be agreed upon by city charter by June 30th. Um, the, the next fiscal year starts July 1st. So that's the hard deadline. We heard it could be an slightly accelerated timeline this year, although we heard that and then we heard some pushback against that. So we are operating with urgency. We think the, the budget hearings, they, the city council first has budget hearings, then they engage in negotiations. The budget hearings finished last week. This week, next couple of weeks will be the weeks of negotiations. And so that's the timeline we're operating on. Usually there's a handshake agreement kind of last week in June and the final budget is decided end of June. Were those all those questions? Um, we have another question from, uh, 
Elise, and I believe, um, Daryl, if you cannot answer, if maybe uh, Maria can answer this question. Um, Maria, just let us know if you're unmuted already. Um, the question is, does the asset map on CC, the CCC website that you mentioned include remote resources or other ways that resources have adapted since COVID? Uh, and Maria or Daryl, feel free to ask for clarity. Uh, I, I unmute Maria. So she should uh, be able to, here she is. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi. So the asset map and the youth uh, resources there are coming from the DYCD open like data set available publicly. It is a data as of June 2019. So it does not include uh, any of the more recent changes or, or developments. We do have a uh, constant uh, trials of conversations with different agencies and in particular with DYCD in an attempt of uh, getting more up-to-date data. They do have their Discover DYCD portal, which they update internally. That is another publicly available source to, to view the after school and other DYCD assets. So I would say our tool in combination with their tool probably will, give, will be the, the best place to start to explore your the data. And, I, and I'll just add one thing. I think, I think she touched on what, um, what the, the person asked what programs are doing and how they've adapted right now. You check out their websites, although those websites probably haven't been totally updated with that. Um, I found that their social medias, most providers have Facebook and Instagram accounts and they're engaging in the same advocacy we are. And so they are highlighting what they're doing for students. So I would check out those provided social media accounts if, if you want some examples of how they've adapted. Okay, and that's all the questions I see so far. So if anyone else on the webinar, okay, I see a raised hand. Give me one minute. Okay, there was a raised hand, but I don't see it anymore. Um, so if, okay. I think I see it, yeah. I'll get to you. Okay, I believe the person who raised their hand, um, you should be able to speak now. All right. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, good. All right. So is there a primer for newbies in this area of funding um, for social agencies? Because I find myself uh, intensely interested in this, in this area. I mean, how does, what's the process of, of funding? Uh, that that occurs in NYC. I mean, you could say, well, it starts at the community level and people people voice their opinions and their concerns. Uh, is, is that really how it works? Or once it gets to the politicians, what what do they do? So that is a good question. I think that as a professional advocate, I don't even have an answer to that question, right? Um, in terms of who shapes policy is essentially what your question is, right? In New York City, because in terms of who well, decides so, them. Yeah, yeah, who shapes policy, but then how does the money, um, who decides where the money's gonna go? So I, those, I think the decisions are made, are influenced by a variety of different parties, right? The mayor has his agenda, and the mayor really, as the person who presents the budget to the council, gets, gets to exert his agenda the most. So if your question is, why did DYCD get cut the most and, and not other agencies? That is a very fair question. And I think it's something that we're bringing up, right? Why are we seeing a total elimination as opposed to a certain percent cut here and a certain percent cut there? Um, again, the mayor pitched his defense to that as the safety of the programs, but we don't really think that's legitimate. Um, the council then of course has their priorities, which they get to exert in reaction to the budget. Um, but when there's so little money to go around when the budget is this bleak, uh, it is tough and it's, it really comes down to what are the bare essentials and parts of a recovery that need to be funded. We think this is part of that recovery. I think the mayor's chosen to prioritize other areas, housing and hunger, which, which we've commended him for, but he's chosen to prioritize those other areas in terms of funding during this tough budget year. And, and we think some other areas just warrant some more, more money. I don't think that answers your question. Um, it's just well, maybe it some slight insight. It does, and also um, 
thank you for bearing with me. Is there, is there an online site or maybe something within the CCC itself that would give a primer or a primer to, to budgeting for somebody? So there's, a, so there's a lot of good resources on, on budgeting. Um, we have, have uh, recently published a webinar on the, the federal updates as well as city and state budget um, that I believe is on our website. Carlos, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, in terms of really basic budgeting, like how the city budget process works, there's a couple good uh, resources for that. I'd say one is the city's budget office, OMB, the Office of Management and Budget, usually has helpful documents if you just wanna see how that city budget process usually works. Um, and then there's an independent budget office, the IBO, that also has really helpful documents. I would say those are two good resources to start. All right, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. And if you're looking for a particular resource of what was just mentioned, I'm providing my contact information in the chat box. Uh, and in the follow-up email, you'll also have contact information to reach out to us. So just send us an email and we'll be able to connect with you with anything specific. Okay, um, great. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, so next we have Kavita um, with the question, why is Sonic why is the Sonic program left out of the budget each year? Yeah, why is it? <laughs> um, it's something that's been happening for a long time. It's not the whole, to be clear, it's not the whole Sonic program. Uh, there are a certain amount of spots that are baselined, as we call it. Um, but largely, it's something that we just always have to one-year fund. Uh, and there's a lot of programs like that. There's a lot of parts of the city that do not get baselined in the budget, but instead have to be discretionally funded by the city council or by the mayor uh, every single year over and over again, these one-shot deals. And unfortunately, this has just long been one of them, no matter how much we've advocated. And then the next question we have uh, is, is there information or data being collected around how many organizations are being impacted by budget layoffs and furloughs? Uh, so in terms of just Youth services, uh, yes, we're, we're really trying to get a scope on those numbers now. So what we hear from in terms of these numbers are when we get a letter publicized, right? Like I mentioned, a letter from University Settlement, which is a big organization and provider that they're laying off 200 people. Um, we've heard of Good Shepherd having to lay off a lot of people. We are just starting now to try to get a sense of, can we survey programs to get a sense of how many staff they've had to lay off and then take those numbers to, um, to electeds, to DYCD, to, to ask them about it. We, we did ask um, our, the chair of youth services, Debbie Rose, to ask DYCD if they're collecting these numbers. And I believe the commissioner said that they are not. But uh, we're trying to get a sense of that. Uh, it's not an exact science because it would just be based on a survey of providers that we have contact with. But it is significant. When it comes to seasonal staff, when it comes to full-time staff, who are maybe if not laid off but furloughed, it is significant. And if you think just about some, some raw back of the envelope calculations, right? If we're talking about 70,000 students in Compass and Sonic, where there's a required one to 10 student staff ratio, we're talking about thousands of staff, right? Um, so, so we think it's significant. We're trying to get a sense informally, at least of those numbers now, but we haven't had it as of yet. Great. And I just want to bring up that someone um, shared with us, uh, Shakina Shaw, uh, in terms of uh, ways of entry to receive resources uh, for anyone looking, um, uh, anyone looking for resources for programming, you can also do this through local city council members and RFPs that are released. Yeah, that's great. Okay. I think, is that all the questions, Carlos? I'm trying to scroll through chat. Yes, if uh, anyone, okay, uh, Marilyn has a question. Let me unmute. Okay, Marilyn, I have uh, unmuted yourself, but you might have to unmute on your end. Well, I don't know. There you go. Okay, great, thanks. Um, I should know this, but we're, um, we have a shortfall of uh, six billion and then it said, and um, the revenue shortfall, is that net in the six billion or is that also um, on top of it? It's not on top of it. So it's, so $6 billion is, is like the budget gap. Um, okay. While the 7.8 is a projected loss of revenue. But as I mentioned, it, because it's projected, it's constantly changing. And unfortunately it's right now, it's constantly increasing as the economic 
impact is kind of being fully understood. Um, so it's, it is getting higher, but it's not on top of it, no. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think we're all good then, unless there's any last minute questions. Carlos had to leave to do another panel. But otherwise, we are going to send this out. Uh, we'll have a recording of this as well as the slides itself. Um, and thank you guys so much for joining today. Thank you. It was so helpful. Thanks, Marilyn. Thank you.